your brother and your sister today. Amen. That's what we need to do. That's what we're called to do. Hallelujah, Lord. Make that real in our hearts, Jesus. Lord, that we would stand for our brothers and sisters wherever they are in this world, God. And lift them up, Lord. Yes.
Psalm 96, it says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Lord, we just we, we proclaim your greatness today. We speak it out loud that you are amazing in every way, that you are powerful beyond understanding. God, that you are great in every way, that you are faithful to the very end. And Lord, we, we, we say that today. We, we proclaim it today. Everything you are, we worship you. You are worthy of our songs, of our voices, of our hands lifted, of our attention. And Lord, we thank you for these moments right now. In the mighty and strong name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. As the ushers come, we're going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Hey, the past month, we've had a, a lot of different offerings, and we just want to say thank you. Praise God for the different things you've been able to do as a, uh, we've been able to do as a church for Speed the Light, um, for Convoy of Hope. Um, and mission, uh, other missions areas. We just uh, are just so uh, excited about what God has been doing through our giving as a church. And uh, let, me, let me pray today. Lord, thank you that we get, again, to express uh, our worship to you in giving. And I pray that as we give today, uh, it just comes from hearts that are full of gratefulness, uh, hearts that uh, recognize that you own everything, and this giving today is a reflection of that fact that, God, you own it all. We love you, and we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Hey, how many made it out Friday night? Anybody get out here Friday night? We had over 100 people here. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, we we're here. And uh, yeah, we, we kind of had to switch gears Friday night. We had the all church movie night, had to switch gears and have the movie in the, in the chapel because we, uh, our inflatable screen, when the guy was setting it up, it hit a parking sign and slid a hole in it and blah, blah, blah. And so anyways, it was still a great time. And uh, so many of you helped out and really made that night a really fun night. And so we appreciate it. It was so good to just, it's just good to hang out, right? Sometimes it's just good to hang out together. And uh, that, was a, that was a great night. So uh, Wednesday night, we have Bible study coming up. And uh, the series is a three-week series called Crazy Like Us. Now, we are not talking about your crazy family members and all that. No, we're not, we're not talking. We could talk about that, but we're not talking about that. It's a... It's a series about generosity. If you missed last week, please come this Wednesday, and I promise you that you'll be encouraged in your faith um, uh, in, in that series. Youth Camp Deposits, they are coming up fast. Today, can you believe it? Today is May 1st. Like, this just does not seem possible, but it is May 1st. Summer is here. I was actually on the water yesterday. Uh, Chuck, I was thinking of you. It was a great time out in the water. And, uh, but youth camp is coming up quickly. Again, uh, May 15th is a, is a deposit date. And then June 12th balance. Sign ups in the lobby. Make sure you check that out. And then our children's minister research time, May 22nd, which is three weeks from today. Make sure you're aware of those dates. See Lucy Hale if you have any questions. And then, of course, praise calendar dates. We have young adults as well. Uh, Top Golf. If you're a young adult or if you know a young adult, you want to go to Top Golf. I'm not even a young adult, and I really would like to go to Top Golf. And I'm going to talk to Sam and see if I can go. I don't even know if I'm allowed. But what a good time, May 13th. Please see Sam and check that out. And if you are a guest today, um, there's a Connect card probably in front of you. Um, if you would complete that for us, so we can respond and, and say thank you for being here. Just complete that, turn it in to the information center in the lobby. They have a nice gift for you, and it'll just help us be able to thank you for being here today, and we appreciate it. And uh, we just sung about God is here. You know, God is here when his people are there, and his spirit is there, and his word is there. And so welcome Pastor Brandon as he comes to give us God's word today. <laughs> Good morning. So I didn't know if I wanted to share this today with you, but Lynn and I are now proud parents. I gave birth to a six millimeter kidney stone this week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> if you've ever had the experience, it's been a trying week. And today actually, honestly, is the first day I've had no, no pain. Uh, each, each day was different. I didn't know what to expect. I was thinking I can't have it on Sunday morning. I know I'm speaking. I don't want to go into it, so it is off my mind, and we, uh, we don't have any pictures to show right now, maybe in the coming days. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't know if you know this this week, but this Thursday is National Prayer Day, and Heather, I don't know if you knew that, because the songs you were, you know, stand in the gap, we pray, we stand in the gap for other people, I didn't know if you even knew that or not, um, but, you know, it, it, it's a tradition in, in our country, it's a great great tradition, you know, that they would do that. But we know that, you know, every day, every day, and we need to be praying for our nation, absolutely. And each one of us uh, should be developing a prayer life. Um, and so I'm coming at this from a, a little bit different angle, and I want to talk about a place uh, in Scripture that we read about. And it gets its name from the obvious orchards that it, that it has. It is called the Mount of Olives. And I know you've heard that many times through Scripture. It was basically, it occupied the space between the Temple Mount and the Judean Desert. And it, it sat in the middle, and it was known for its many olive groves. Any olive fans out there? I'm, yes, man, some people just right out of the jar. Or, you remember the disgusting pimento loaf they used to make? Like a piece of ham with olives sliced in it? Uh, it just didn't appeal to me. My brother loved it. Um, but that is what it's known for. I, I actually, my family and I had the privilege of being there. Um, but unfortunately for me, I was 14 years old and very, I, I didn't get what I should have gotten out of the experience in the Holy Land. I, I uh, 
took a lot of things for granted. I was a little too immature to appreciate. I so wish I could be there again uh, to, to know that these places that we're walking along were where Christ spent his ministry and, and would have done all of these things, these amazing things in Scripture that we read about. So obviously for its name, for its orchards, it is also known as the Mount of Anointing because the olive oil that it produced was used to anoint the kings and the priests uh, in the temple. And uh, due to the fact that uh, it, you know, it, it, it had all of these things, it also had a couple of other things. It was a, a unique uh, view over the entire city of Jerusalem. Uh, it is famously known, if you remember, that Jesus stood at that, mo at that point and wept over the city of Jerusalem. Um, it, has, it also continues to be to this day and has been for 3,000 years a, a Jewish burial place. It is said that there are over 150,000 graves and, and continuing, they, they keep doing it. And actually it fell out of Israel's hands uh, into Jordanian hands at one point and when they had control of it, they began to do some, some work to it and they destroyed 38,000 of those graves. But Israel once again took possession of it, and it has been a place of visitation now. Uh, you know, obviously people go and they visit there. Uh, it is a very special place. And what I want to point out to you too is Jesus treated this as a very special place as well. And I think for us this morning, as we, as we view maybe in light of National Prayer Day or just in our prayer lives, we would all benefit from such a place that we could go to. Uh, Noah was doing life group this morning. I was like, this is getting right into my class, like into my sermon here, but about having a secret place to go to, to commune and talk with God with limited distraction. Uh, you know, sometimes you got to go out to your car to get limited distraction. If you, you know, if you live in a household with kids, there's not much quiet or once bedtime hits, that's the time uh, to go. But you know your, your situation, you know your circumstances, and we can just kind of all put it behind us. Just whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, we can put the burdens of life behind us and just seek God's face. Amen. You'll forgive me. One of the medications I'm taking dries my mouth out like nobody's business. And I feel like everybody sees it. Maybe you did, but <laughs> anyway, Jesus, we know, taught us much about prayer. And, you know, Jesus wasn't doing this. Uh, obviously, he, he taught the disciples how to pray, and we'll read that scripture in just a minute. And not only did he teach us and demonstrate it, he made it a priority. Jesus, the man, knew he needed this communion with God. And we can only, we can only guess that now that he's in the flesh, he is now separated from what he had with God. He was in God's presence, in communion with him, and now he is separated and so he, it was more than him just, you know, doing it for my benefit or the disciples' benefit. I'm going to go over here and show them how I pray. No, he knew the importance and the need for it in his own life. And the fact that Jesus prayed should give us all the motivation to, that we need to know that we need to be on our knees before the Lord and seeking him in prayer. It is vital, it is necessary to commune with God in, the, in this way. And, and Jesus proved it, showed us. And we need to be doing that too. First scripture I want to point to is Matthew 6, 5 through 8. And Jesus is talking to the, the disciples. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues when everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is the, all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. And then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need before you even ask him. And then he goes on to, to teach them, pray like this, our father who art in heaven. We know these, these scriptures. And as I read that this morning, I'm taken back... <laughs> And the, the, the proof that happens is people begin, you see this on social media all the time. Somebody puts a Bible in the morning in their cup of coffee and they take a picture and they pr put it out there back to God's word today. And then pretty soon the pictures start fading. And it's like we all get this motivation that, oh, we got to get back to this. And then we begin to dwindle again. 
And sometimes you, you put it out there, you know, and you got to live up to the expectations you, you've set for yourself. Uh, I, I've seen this, I, I follow this guy on YouTube that does a lot of worship tutorials like songs, you know, shows you how to play the songs on guitar and he's got a great channel and everything. Well, he started this separate one that was going to follow his weight loss. And it went about a week, and then it went two weeks, and then no more videos. And the videos that he keeps making doesn't look like he lost any weight. And so you set yourself up, you know, to, uh, there is nothing wrong with getting into God's word at all. But when we begin to tout it, when we begin to, like the hypocrites, love to pray out loud and be known and seen, but we're not following through, we set ourselves up, you know, to, for ridicule. And, and not that we do it for that reason, but sometimes that's what happens. Jesus is saying, don't just babble on and on. When we, when we, and I know pastors talked about it and really just broken it down, that prayer is nothing more than conversation with God. And I will say this, it is not just one way conversation with God. God will speak if we are listening. And so today, as, I, as we look kind of at the Mount of Olives, I want to point out four things that it represents. That this is just what I took away from it, and I want to talk about them. First and foremost, it was and is a place of prayer. Uh, almost a thousand years prior to Jesus walking this land and, and, and walking the same mount, we see King David, who is king, but he is being overthrown by his son Absalom. He is on the run, and we, we, we come to a place where, uh, you know, David is approaching and he's telling the, the priest to take the ark back to the city. And David is beginning to, uh, within himself, uh, stir up with, with emotion. Because at this point, not only does he, doesn't, he doesn't know if he'll ever return to that city, he feels like he's forfeiting the ark back and, and now it's out of his possession. He doesn't know if he'll ever see it again. And in 2 Samuel, we reread this. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. And all the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. Now David had been told that, um, I should have had this recorded like Pastor did last week. Ahithophel, <laughs> I'm gonna, that's, how, that's how he's going to be known. Ahithophel uh, is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. Prior to even David's account, this mount had been used for worship of God Almighty. There are countless uh, kings buried there, countless Jews that were, you know, have died through the ages. And David is now walking up and he is, he is weeping, just as we know Jesus wept over the city there. It was a place that David knew he could go to to commune with God. It was a place that Jesus became very fond of and went time and time again. Uh, just some quick little verses here. It says in Luke 21, 37, every day Jesus went to the temple to teach. And each evening he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. It is where he found rest. It is where he found refuge. And I want to ask you today, do you have a place like that? Do you have a place that you can go that you just find rest? Because we all know we can go through a day and, and very wearily come to a point and, and sometimes, you know, the best intentions, we, we go to bed and think, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open myself up to you tonight and boom. Next thing you know, you're waking up the next morning. I've done that many times. It's setting that side. It was a place of refuge for Jesus to be able to get away from the crowds. They would be there the next day. The crowds were going to be there and Jesus needed this time not only to rest, but to pray unto God. In Luke 22, 39, it says, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. And that right there tells us that it was not routine in the, in the way that we would think, but it was part of his daily life, as usual. Another version says, as was his custom, he would go to the Mount of Olives. Luke 21 tells us every evening, every evening, he would return to this special place. I had a, um, in 1989, my family, we were living in North Carolina, and uh, Hurricane Hugo came through. I don't know if anybody was in North Carolina at that time. Uh, and it's so funny because we moved to North Carolina from New Jersey, 
and everybody said, leave your snow shovels up in New Jersey. We don't get snow down here. We don't get storms down here. So we did that, and our first year there, we had a huge snowstorm. Two years later, we had Hurricane Hugo, and it was, it was rough. I had, as a kid, I, I somewhat remember storms like that. Uh, but this one, I remember in my bedroom, you know, now that I look at it, I probably didn't have very good windows, but the water was rushing underneath my window into my room, like the wind was just pounding it. All that to say that we had this huge pine tree in the back of our yard. And uh, over, over, everybody's, you know, everybody's different yard, we only had a, a four foot fence on everybody's yard, and, and this person to our right had a metal shed, run down, beat up. But the wind took that shed and it, it hit that tree in our yard. And unbeknownst to me, because, you know, who wants to, we don't want to lose a tree in the yard, whatever. My younger brother, Heath, who would have probably been 12 years old at this time and had already previously, unbeknownst to anybody, that tree for a, a 12-year-old boy was his Mount of Olives. He would climb to the peak of that tree to pray. It's my younger brother, the kid that I slap around. He's climbing a tree to pray to God. And I, I had to call him. I said, because I, I thought I heard that you, you know, you're looking out your window very differently than we are. We see a shed hit our tree, but here you're, you're taking it in a way that you're losing a part of something very special to you. And it's so funny. He said, no, he said, I don't really remember thinking about it like that. But this is what brought it about. This is how I knew that he did this uh, in this tree. And he said, you know what I used to do? He said, I used to wait for everybody in the house would all sit down at the same time in the evening to watch a TV program, and I'd go out. He said, because I knew mom and dad would never let me climb a tree, you know, by myself at that age. But he said, I was actually, he was talking to my father a lot about being filled with the Holy Spirit during that time. And he said, I would sit in that tree and the breeze would blow. And he said, I always heard there was a mighty rushing wind. And I would hear the pine needles blow and think, here it comes, it's coming. But to think that when I look back, again, your annoying little brother, and I was an annoying older brother, I'm very sure, had a place that he could go to commune with God. He made it an, an effort. And sometimes that's what it takes for us. Because we're in our familiar surroundings but to be intentional about going to a place where we can commune and get quiet before the Lord and have that opportunity. Um, we didn't lose the tree. I don't know if he continued going there because I didn't really, I wasn't involved in my brother's life all that much, I guess. We did, we just, we did certain things together. But he, even at a young age, was developing a consistent prayer life as Jesus demonstrated in his own life. And for him and for us, we need to turn it into a priority that's vital. Uh, you know, to think that we're making any decision outside of the counsel of God, we've got to be seeking him in every one of those. And it gives us an awesome opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one audience with God Almighty. Amen. It was a special place. It was a place of prayer. Secondly, it was a, these are all P's, a place of Proclamation. As we've just come through the Holy Week, we, we came from, from Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday last week, and celebrating all of these things. You know the, the, the portion of Scripture very familiarly, but on Palm Sunday, this would be the day where Jesus rode in uh, on, a, on a colt and, and was, was recognized as the king that he was. And I'm going to read that for you. Luke 19, 36 through 40 says, As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying such things like that. And he replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. Into cheers. Do you know what it means to proclaim? It means to shout it from the rooftops. Whether, you know, when we think about life, whether you declare your, the love for your wife or your husband, and you can't, be, you can't contain it, you've got to shout it out. These people got it. They saw their king riding as was prophesied. 
and they shouted, they declared the name of the Lord. And it, it, they do this in order to make it known. And as we know, um, it, it says that they, uh, in this verse, that they began to shout, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to ask you, what, is your, what do you proclaim today? What, what would people say about you? Because we can give a lot of different information. Um, you know, again, if, if people are surprised that you're a Christian, you're probably not proclaiming what you should be proclaiming. Um, but I would dare say this too, just like when, when you put yourself out there, if you are proclaiming the name of the Lord, you need to be walking that walk because people will see right through it, right through the hypocrisy. And we need to be standing in the Lord today, letting our boast and our proclamation be Jesus Christ is our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. It was a place of prayer. It was a place of proclamation. And it was a place of pressing. The olives, as they go through the process, they're, they're picked. You know, and I'm sure the, the, it's changed over years. You know, some places you still see they still use the original way that they did it. I'm assuming that there's a much more uh, efficient way to do it today. But they would pick the olives. And they would go through a crushing process first to turn them into pulp. You know, they could have very hard skins. But this crushing process would, would leave them vulnerable and then they would go through what's called a pressing. And that, it, that was, I, I should have pulled the picture up that I had, but it was a, a concrete pad or a stone pad that had very heavy stones that would press those things till they, they pressed out all the oil they could possibly put out. You know, they, they went under this tremendous pressure. And what's, what's really cool to me is the, the Garden of Gethsemane. We know this phrase, we, we've heard it time and time again throughout scripture and throughout sermons and everything, stories, there is an olive grove called Gethsemane. It is in the Mount of Olives, but it is, a, it is a smaller grove. The word Gethsemane is derived from two Hebrew words. The first is gath, which means wine press, and the second is shemen, which means oil, which is where we get an oil press. This is what the, the, the job of the, that press was to do. They went through the crushing process. They went into the heavy, intense uh, stone blocks to extract their oil. It is said, actually, that some of these trees, in still, still to this day in the Mount of Olives, are 2,000 years old. Some are 1,000, some are 2,000. To think that these same trees are the ones that Jesus may have walked past, would have, would have been by. But it is said that the ones that are oldest bring forth the best oil. The most natural, clean oil are the older trees. And I can't help but feel that when we look at this process, we can't help but see the parallels between what Jesus Christ did on behalf of us. It was here in Gethsemane that we read in, in Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. And to, he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went up a little farther and bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Luke's gospel account, he writes this. Then an angel at the same time from heaven appeared and strengthened him. And he prayed more fervently. And he was in such agony of, of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Jesus actually using the words, my soul is crushed. And the agonizing and the suffering that he would go through. And this pressing, that, that's the image that I get. And yet his prayer through all of this, you know this, we use this all the time in so many scriptures, his prayer was, yet not my will, but yours be done. And that should be our prayer as well. All of this was the night before the crushing of his physical body he would endure on the cross for us. And as the olive is pressed between these heavy stones uh, to, to release this oil, 
so too did the weight of my sin and your sin press upon the man, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And yet he did it, did it willingly for you and me. I think it's a beautiful picture. It's beautiful in terms of its, its analogy, but just such a humbling experience for each one of us as we've, again, I, I didn't speak any time leading up to Easter, and I'm not just trying to bring us back to Easter because I didn't get to speak on Easter. This is something we, we should be facing and recognizing of what Jesus Christ did for each one of us. So it was a place of pressing. And finally today I want to say it is a place of promise. It is a place of promise. After Jesus was resurrected, and you know this well, he was reunited with the disciples. And he, for 40 days, made appearance to many others and spent time with them. And Acts, 4, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 12 says this. Once he was eating with them, and he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, for they, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, through Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them, men of Galilee. They said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him in the same way you saw him go. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. That's very important. This means that Jesus ascended from the peak of the Mount of Olives. And a distance of a half a mile, when they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. So not only do we get the wonderful promise from Jesus that there is one coming who is now here, the Holy Spirit, who will give us power. This is his promise. I want you to read with me in Zechariah 14 because he ascended from this point. In Zechariah 14, there, there are two returns of the Lord, if you know this. There is going to be a trumpet blast where those in Christ will be called to join him. But there is a second coming where he's not coming as a lamb. He is not coming as a child. He is coming with an army with a sword in his hand. Do you know who that army is? That's you and I. And we are coming back. I want to read Zechariah 14 first. It says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split apart, making wide valley running from east to west. And half the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. And you will flee through this valley, for it will, be, it will reach across to Azal. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. And then the Lord my God will come, and all with his holy ones with him. That is you and I. On that day, the sources of light will no longer shine. Yet there will be continuous day, for the Lord knows how this could happen. There will be no normal day or night, for at evening time it will still be light. And on that day, life-giving waters will flow out of it from Jerusalem, half toward the Dead Sea and half toward the Mediterranean, flowing continuously in both summer and winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name alone will be worshipped. Hallelujah. That day is coming. And as I said, this is in Revelation 19. Here's what it says. Then I saw heaven opened. And a white horse was standing there, and its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a, a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, follow him on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations." He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God 
the Almighty, the juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe and on his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is the Jesus that is coming back with an army of believers. You and I are going to look real good dressed in white. Real good. The Mount of Olives this morning is a special place. Still remains there to this day. And what I want you to take away from this today is I have said this. It is a place of prayer, proclamation, pressing, and promise. And I want to encourage you today that if you and I will find that quiet place to pray, and that in that place we will proclaim the name of the Lord. We will worship him. We will, we will proclaim and declare who he is from our hearts. If we will accept his forgiveness of our sin, accept him into our lives, and also allow the Holy Spirit to press upon us, because I do believe that is his job, to point out those things, to refine us. And I'm, I'm so thankful to God that we don't have to go through what Christ went through. He did it all. He paid it all. But we many times kind of go our own way. Talked about it this morning in Life Group. We, we want to go outside of the will of God and then say, oh, God is doing this to me. No, he's not. Your decision is doing that to you. God is showing you the way. The pressing. We go through there. We pray. We proclaim his name. We have promises available to us today that we forfeit. We forfeit when we go out of his will. Don't forfeit the promises of God. The promise is, the, the ultimate promise is that one day we will be with him for eternity. We will reign and rule with him when he comes back to this earth. As we, <clears throat> as we look to communion today, as Pastor Hans is going to come today, as we await this, this return of the Lord, he, the, I'm just waiting for the rapture. I, you know, I want to I hear that trumpet blast. I want to go in, in that way. 1 Corinthians 11.26 says this, For every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And I say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We need you, Lord. We need you. And I pray that you would be able to find a place that is very special even unto yourself, where you know this is where I go and meet with the Lord. I'm not telling you to go climb a pine tree today. Don't take that. Kids, don't say, Pastor Brandon told me to climb the tree. I'm telling you, it could be your car. It could be a, a room in your house where you can go and, and shut off. You know, I don't think your husband or wife would, would say anything if you said, I, you know, I just need to go and pray. I mean, if you're in there for like an hour or two and the kids are out there screaming, you know, and you're in there just on your phone, that's a different story. Find that quiet place of prayer. Proclaim the name of the Lord. Allow his Holy Spirit to work upon you to bring forth that beautiful oil from our lives. We have the promises of God available to us today. Amen. So as Pastor Hans comes this morning, I just want to pray. Father, help us. Help us to find that place, Lord God, where we commune with you. Lord, it is vital for our growth. Vital for our survival, Lord, is to to, to speak to you, Lord, to, to unburden our lives, Lord, and, and just give you the glory. Lord, give you the burdens and, and just say, Lord, they're yours. Lord, and help us as we seek you. Lord, bless this today. We pray as we go to communion. We give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Pastor Brandon, thank you so much for that powerful challenge. We really, um, really appreciate that. If you want to find your communion element there, I know some of you um, maybe didn't have one sitting right next to you, but you want to do that now and uh, make sure that you have, uh, have that available to you for, for these next few moments. Well, staying with your, your, your P words, um, I want to read a passage. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And uh, that used to be a passage more often used when we receive communion. We're going to call this a, a time to probe, to allow the Lord to, to really search us for a moment. And um, one of the things, if you read that passage in 1 Corinthians 11, is at the time of the Lord's Supper, of remembering the body and the blood of Christ, what we would call communion today, was very much a time of not you and I individually, but us and we. And uh, how people treated each other, being first, putting others first, that matters when we're receiving. And uh, it used to be kind of tradition or, or really not uncommon when people receive communion that they would kind of not receive it if they had problems with each other, even within uh, a church. And I'm not asking you to not receive today, but I am uh, asking you this, that remember your relationships with, with each other really matter to God. Super important. That was the problem with the Corinthian church. It was all about themselves, and they didn't care about that relationship with each other. They were more interested in their own needs and their own everything than what was happening in the, 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 the body in a, in a greater way. And so this morning, I want to just take a moment. There's no music playing. It's just silent here. But I want you to take a moment and just allow the Holy Spirit to probe, examine your heart. And if there's something, maybe, have you ever had this happen? Something happens, something said, and you just sit on it for days and weeks, and you know what's going on. And maybe right now you need to say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for the part I played. Forgive me for, for letting an emotion rule me in that moment and not you. But let's just take a moment and do that, and then we'll receive together in just a minute. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your work. We thank you for speaking to people's hearts today. We thank you for your word that Pastor Brandon shared. Lord, thank you for our need for you. It keeps us in that place of needing you and recognizing that we need you. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We pray that as we receive it together in just a moment, we remember that you gave your life to be broken for our sins, for our shame, for our need. Lord, you did that for us, and you allowed it to happen. Thank you for your broken body. We receive it today with a grateful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive together. Lord, thank you for your blood that was shed. Lord, what can we say other than thank you? What can we say other than, or we are grateful for your blood that was shed for us. Again, which you gave your life freely. Thank you for the power that is in your blood, the perfect sacrifice, the, the sacrifice that was once and for all. And we are grateful to celebrate and remember you today. And your blood that, that not only washed us clean once, but continues to do that. Lord, thank you for this moment and for being able to receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive together. Could we stand together this morning? The Mount of Olives was a place of prayer, remember? Who can tell me? Well, actually, I won't call that out because that'll take forever. <laughs> it was a place of prayer. Remember, it was a place of promise. It was a place of proclamation. It was a place of pressing. I didn't go in the order. Of pressing. And uh, whatever in your life, maybe you're in one of those places where, my God, I need one of your promises, or you're in that place of pressing, or whatever it is, 
We want to pray for you today that God would really work and minister in your life. Lord, thank you that for even you, Jesus, you had a place. You're the son of God. You could have picked any place. Lord, you picked a very interesting place. Lord, a place with tremendous history and tremendous meaning. And that was a place that you just love to be with your father. And Lord, across this room, Lord, let everyone here find that place if they don't have one. Lord, make it a place where they can uh, experience you to be able to proclaim your goodness, your mercy, your kindness over their life and your promises over their life. And Lord, when life is pressing them, they can have a place to go. Lord, I pray blessing over them. And during these times of prayer, Lord, I pray you do miracles in their life, that you would uh, accomplish things that they could never accomplish, do miracles in their life that they could never have imagined, not only in their lives, but in the lives of people that they pray for. God, we thank you for um, a, a church where we love the word of God and where we uh, realize we need to be continue to grow and to be a people of prayer. And I pray that this coming week, that would, you would use our prayers in a powerful way as a church to move your kingdom forward and to see you, Jesus, uh, be brought um, more up front in our lives and everything we do and say. Bless your people today from the youngest to the oldest. As we go, help us to be a light wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen.